What's going on people, it's your boy John the Dreamer. In today's video, we're gonna break down the importance of using reverb within your beats and why you should be using return tracks to make this happen. Let's get into the video. So one of the things I noticed listening to new producers is the lack of reverb within their beats or the excess of reverb within their beats meaning they're using way too much. And generally that means there's a lack of understanding when it comes to reverb and why it's important within our music. So from my perspective, reverb is very important because it makes everything sound realistic to some extent. What we have to remember is most of us are sitting here using doors, using computers to make music, just using sounds and samples that are relatively dry. And when you put those all together, it's just gonna sound really dry and quite lifeless. And it's one of the reasons why live musicians, some, well, some live musicians don't really like making music using computers just because they say it sounds too digital, sounds unrealistic. You know, all of those topics tend to come up. And to me, I, I usually find it's because it's a lack of realism and Reverb is the, the key and the vehicle to bring us there. So let's get into the ways that I'm going to use reverb. What I'm going to do, I'm going to play you a quick beat. I just made this beat now just for this video. Let's point out some areas that we could use some reverb to enhance the performances of some of my instruments and some of the sounds. So that's the two sections. And for those that are asking how I'm triggering stuff, I'm using my launch pad just because easy and it's to hand. So what did you think needed some reverb? What did you think needed to sound more realistic? I'm going to break it down and say this flute right here is so dry. It just doesn't feel like it's commanding the space that it deserves. And we want to make it more of a, a feature piece. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solo the other parts of it and just play it again. I want it to be a lot more epic and a way you can do that is to use reverb. So what we're going to do is we're going to search and um, go to our audio effects and we're going to, a 11 has got all these crazy folders now, but I'm just going to cut to the reverb. I like to use the warm reverb long. So what I'll do is drag that onto this track here, just so you guys can hear what I'm trying to achieve. But the problem with this now is it's completely washed out and you know you can't just drag a reverb on here and just expect it to work we're going to have to do a few tweaks to make sure it works correctly so first thing i'd probably do is put the dry down to about 50 percent and have a listen and what that means is we're having a dry signal which is a signal we already have and now the wet signal which is being affected with the reverb have that on about 50 percent, and that way we can hear both the reverb sounds nice but it doesn't necessarily sound like it works within the context we're in and that's because we haven't worked out the pre-delay time for the bpm we're working at now this beat is actually at 140 beats per minute now every single bpm that you use for every single one of your beats or your compositions has its own sort of time division system that you need to adhere to so for example i'm at 140 beats per minute and i need to type in the right information or the right number so the pre-delay is in sync with the BPM. Now there's a few ways you can work out this number. One of the quick ways to do it just from using some of Aperton's basic set tools is to right click and set your grid to one over 16 and actually just highlight a 16th note of the grid. Now, if you look at the bottom, you can see it says duration 00, 107. The last three digits is what we really want to pay attention to because that's the number we need to put into our pre-delay so we can set our reverbs to be completely in time with our BPM. So just to make sure you understand this, if you guys change your BPM later, you're gonna have to reset your pre-delays. So maybe you want to fix this towards the end of your production process, but I like to do it while I'm in the process just because I can get an understanding of where I'm trying to take all of these sounds and it really helps the sound design and even the mix of where I'm trying to take my beats because I like to kind of mix that go or just be aware of where I'm trying to push things in, within the mix later so I can finalize within the master. So if that's a quick way to do it. So what you do is go into the reverb and you just type in 107 and that would be your pre-delay set for your BPM. 
right? There's a whole calculation and there's a whole process that a lot of people talk about on YouTube and break it down. But I just think this is the simplest way. You don't need to know the whole calculation. I don't want to think about the calculation when I'm making a beat. I just want to know this most simplified steps to get it in time, right? And I've always found that 16th notes is more than enough to make sure my reverb's in time. You know, you could always rough it and do it by ear or just do it till it sounds good. It's completely up to you. It's your beat. But if you do want to set it so it's in time with the grid, that's a way to do it. Another way to do it is I'm going to bring out my trusty Swiss Army Meter which is i've spoke about in my eight way glide tutorial i'm going to put a card at the top of the screen for you to click on if you haven't seen that video make sure you go and watch it because we're using the same plugin and i actually show you where you can get it in that video um, i'll put a link in the description for this one also but based on my bpm of this track it actually breaks down all of the different note divisions and time divisions for you so you can see 16th notes is 107.14 so we could actually type that into apen if we wanted to to get the precise number now what we'll find is if we ever listen to it it will sound a lot nicer Now, some of you guys are probably thinking, well, that sounds actually quite nice. Maybe we should apply this to the other tracks. And you're right. We could do that. We could actually go into here. Yeah, we could copy and paste this and put it onto this track. Let me just turn off the reverb on Keyscape because that one's nice. But we want to have one that's completely set to the grid and have a listen to it. So that works pretty well, but... I'm going to tell you guys that putting them on each individual track is not what you want to do because what you're going to start doing is ramping up your CPU, right? Taking up all that space and we want to avoid that. So what I'm actually going to show you guys how to do now is actually use some return tracks. Now, before we actually break down how to set up a return track, let's actually break down what it is. Now in other doors or in other mixes, they'll just be called bus channels or auxiliary channels. In April and they're called return tracks. And what it is, they act as like a go-between between between the mixer tracks and the master channel. So that means we could put effects on the return track or different devices on there and actually send entire tracks or portions of the tracks into the return channel before it goes to the master. Now let me show you an example of what people usually do when they think about using effects of an Apple and not any other door compared to what they actually really should do to save resources and their CPU and etc. So what normally happens is, let's say you're working on a track, let's use the flute as another example. I'm just going to put the reverb directly onto that flute track. And what's going to happen is we're going to get that effect, but then we're going to notice that throughout the rest of the track, we're going to want to use that same sort of effect on other instruments to keep it all uniformed and sounding consistent. Now what's going to happen is you're going to overload your computer or your CPU. And even if your computer can handle it, it's still not a good practice to do. You want to start getting into the habit of using buses. This is what you should actually do. You should start using your mixes and start sending those tracks into to a return channel for example the reverb here and then that goes to the master and like i said before you don't need to send an entire track you can send portions of it or portions of this one or portions of that one and that gives you additional control because you don't want everything just to be washed out you want to have maximum control when it comes to how much is being sent and how much really needs to be sent just because you can send it doesn't mean you need to send everything so that's a quick breakdown let me show you how to actually do it with enable and live now you can see i've got two return tracks over here if you don't have one guys make sure you press this little r in the corner We'll bring your return tracks up and we're just going to use one for this tutorial so you can delete the first one and you can see that it works so if i go into the return track itself you can see it's completely empty and it says drag audio effects here so i'm just going to right click and paste that reverb that we have and that means that the reverb is now set to the return channel and at any stage we can now send our sounds to that return track all through the same reverb. Now I find this really dope because now this allows all the sounds to kind of mingle with each other because they're all using the same reverb and that's exactly how it would be in a live scenario. If you're in a live recorded space and people are using their instruments, you guys are going to be in the same space. So the sound of the track is going to sound nice. That's why some people say like, oh, I love listening to that band, but they sound better live. And it's not always just based on the playing or the energy. Sometimes it's just based on it sounds nicer when it's in the same room. So as music producers, we're trying to master the art of deception and make our audiences believe that all the instruments within our tracks were recorded in the same room or, or at least existing within the same space. And it's our job to really try and master that. Record production is all about deception. So get your Decepticon on. I tell my, my disco community that all the time. So instead of having this reverb on the flute and on the piano, what we can do now is actually send the flute over to this return channel. So I'm going to play it. See the difference? And we have a little send track on every single track. So if I turn it off, 
drive wet and that just shows you how much you can send you don't have to send the full amount you can send proportions or certain percentages over to the return track now it depends what sound or instrument you want to do and how much you want to send but i'm going to keep the flute on 100 and let's check out the keys and see where they should go Now, if you're not getting too much reverb coming through, what you might want to do is actually go over to your reverb and turn it all the way up to wet. That way you're going to get 100% of the reverb working. And then what you can do now is now go back and test it. So it's a lot more fluid. What you're seeing now is we're using the same reverb for multiple instruments. And that's a game changer and it's going to really help your beats sound a lot more natural, sound a lot more digestible and just more pleasing to the ear. So the next thing we're going to cover in this video is how we can do this and achieve this sort of effect with a drum rack, because we don't want to just send the whole drum rack to the reverb. Let me show you that in action. Let's actually just solo our drum rack here and we're going to play our drums. Very dry. And you don't want to just send your reverb because what happens is you get that. And what we're doing now, we're just smushing the transients of our kicks. Everything's just becoming terrible. Ain't nobody rapping or singing over that. So if you actually go into your drum rack, which I have here and look down here on the left hand side, we've got sends, we've also got returns. So just like we have on the main channels over here, we have one for each individual drum rack. So what I would do is just go into the warm reverb, right click, copy this one because you should, once you've set it for your whole master session you can use the same one for your drum rack so go into your drop where it says returns and you can actually right click and now put that reverb on here and what you'll see is when you open up your drum rack you'll see that every single track here has its own sense so just to show what it looks like without it there's no sense there it's completely empty but this allows us to have reverb on some instruments within your drum rack and some with none so for example you don't want to send reverb to your kick pretty much ever if you're trying to have it to cut through the mix and work but maybe for some of your snares and stuff you're going to want that so let's play it so maybe this one i want to put some reverb on it and you don't want to overdo it like you just want to make it sound a bit more natural Now let's listen to it in the context of the track. Now I urge you to A and B your return track within your drum rack just to make sure you're getting the sound you want. So that's dry, let's turn it on. Very subtly being used, but it can work. For the tutorial, I'm just gonna overkill it so you guys can completely hear it. Turn it off. So that's going to really help bring out the realism and stuff within your drums. And that's the way you do it within the drum rack. Just a quick disclaimer, return tracks can be used not just for reverb, they can be used for multiple things. You can use them for delays. You can use them for various bits of distortion. You can even send return tracks into other return tracks. So if I right click over here and make another return track, I can actually right click on this one and press enable send and also send B back into A or A into B. There's so many possibilities of doing this sort of stuff and it can get really creative and really fun. Another way you can do these things is let's say you're a vocalist and you're recording multiple stems and tracks for yourself. Let's say you've got a recording channel and every single one of these channels is just all your different takes. Instead of having like your compressor, having all of your gates and all your stuff on one channel or having them on every single channel, you can put them on a bus uh, on a return track, put them all on there and then send every single track into that return track. And now you have your compressor, your reverbs, all of that stuff while you're just playing back. You can give yourself a snapshot of what it could be like while you're still recording. And that can be really powerful because you're just using one set of compressors, one set of reverbs, one set of all of that stuff instead of multiple different versions on each different track, which is just going to clog up your CPU and eventually give you latency. And that's the last thing you need when you're starting to record a vocal or a guitar or any other instrument. So yeah, guys, this has just been a little tutorial on how to introduce some reverb and maybe some other effects into your workflow using return tracks and ways that I use when it comes to making beats using a 
you put in live. Uh, if you like this video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. You know, I'm going to be pushing out more tutorials more frequently. But you guys know I love to spend a lot of time on Twitch. So make sure you come along here, drop a follow, catch me live one time, ask me some questions, and I'll break down some stuff while I'm making a beat for you and give you a hand with that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's been your boy, John the Dreamer, and I'm going to see you in the next video.